Hi, this is Corrado Fontana from LinguaggioBiologico.com. I'm the inventor of biocommunication marketing. Biocommunication marketing is the marketing strategies based on the biological language that uh, lets you increase the trust with your customers and your sales team and uh, through the, their biological and subconscious needs. Today, I'm going to share with you a special interview with Professor Rapai Clotet, the founder and CEO of Archetype Discoveries Worldwide and the inventor of reptilian marketing. He's the author of the book Culture Code, where he reveals for the first time the techniques he has used to improve profitability and practices for dozens of 1,400 companies. Without further ado, let's join the interview with Professor Rapai Clotet. Well, uh, welcome to everybody to this uh, interview. I'm honored to guest uh, Dr. Rapaye. I suppose to be the right pronunciation, this one. Rapaye. Uh, Rapaye. 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 Like apple pie? Clotaire. Is it right? My first name, yeah. Let's give the welcome to Dr. Uh, Rapaye Clotaire. Um, he is the founder and CEO of the Archetype Discoveries Worldwide and the inventor of the Reptilian Marketing. It's an honor for me to, uh, for this interview, Mr. Uh, Repai, uh, because uh, maybe um, you are the first marketing consultant or ex expert with the, the Trium Brain that I met in, uh, um, over my country. And um, I read your book that uh, is the culture code that I suggest the people to read because in my opinion is the, the a sort of matrix that uh, is inside every one of us obviously and will uh, teach right uh, as uh, uh, how we should consider the not only marketing but every job in my opinion or every people and so uh, let's start with the the first question uh, Dr. Pai you wrote this book the culture code, right? Yeah. And they read it and they find it awesome, as I told you, because it adds many information to the common uh, uh, theory that we know as uh, the trium brain. Would you explain to our viewers, uh, to um, the people that is just looking or watching this video, they don't read the, the book already, what do you mean for culture code? Well, you see, every culture has a non-concert. I'm sure you remember that uh, uh, Carl Gustav Jung spoke about universal unconscious mm -hmm. and Freud uh, spoke about individual unconscious. Uh, I'm the one in between. Uh, I'm, I think that every culture has an unconscious, which means that according to the culture where you were born in, the language you speak, the way your mother uh, fed you at the beginning, you have a way to look at the world that is unconscious but that pre-organize everything that you do, everything that you feel, uh, the way you buy food, the way you buy clothes, the way you vote, the way you uh, get a wife or a husband, the way you teach your children, everything is pre-organized uh, by the culture. Now, how do we uh, access to this uh, collective unconscious, cultural collective unconscious? And this is what I developed for many, many decades uh, try to get away to the first imprint. Uh, the culture code is imprinted in everybody's mind at the first experience of something. Uh, the first time you experience coffee, the first time you experience uh, milk, or shoes, or mother, love, work, there is always a first time. As a joke, I say you never get a second chance to have a first experience, right? Yeah. So your first experience is the first experience. But it creates some mental connection in your brain that are going to be reinforced by the culture. You know, my first experience of coffee, I was born in France, was a big bowl of milk and coffee. A little coffee, a lot of milk. And I was a kid, and I would drink coffee as a kid. But I would use some tartine and put some bread inside, and that was breakfast, but that was big. Nothing to do with Italian coffee. Yeah. When you see Italian coffee this big and so dense, you see, so. Uh, I can't help it. I, you know, I, I might drink Italian coffee, but I still Obviously. imprinted by my first experience of milk given by my mother, milk and coffee. So that first experience is what we discover. We discover the first imprint. And when we get the first imprint, we find a pattern, uh, yeah. a, a structure that is repeated for everybody's unconscious. 
people are going to tell me, oh, we're different. Sure, you are different, but you still speak the same language. And there is already this, and, and you belong to the same culture. So we, we have things in common with a lot of larger people. Of course, everybody is individual. Everybody is, in, is unique in some ways. But even when you are unique, you still share something in common with a group of people. And so that's what we discovered. We discovered the first imprint and the emotion that is associated with the first imprint. We cannot imprint anything in the brain without emotion. Emotion is what produces the neurotransmitters uh, in, in the brain at the synapse. So a strong emotion, strong imprint. This is why usually people remember when they had a very dramatic incident in their life, uh, but they don't remember you know, things that are more mundane, like where they put their glasses and things like that. So the stronger the imprint, the better. Um, and so what we discover, we take people back to the very first experience and we ask them to, uh, to bring that back. It's, it's more than just to remember, to bring it back. And they do it in an anonymous way. And then we look at all these texts because they write down what they did remember in an anonymous, anonymous way. They don't, they don't put their name there. And we look at pattern and we know we have a method of pattern recognition and we discover at a certain time the same structure, the same order. You know, of, of the way uh, people relate, relate to the subject that we want to understand. Uh, I, I can give you an example. When we did a study for coffee uh, yeah. in for, uh, Folger Coffee in the US, we took people back to their first experience. So at that time, everybody in marketing were trying to sell taste. Oh, my coffee tastes better than yours. What we discover in America is that the first imprint is not taste. You imprint coffee in America when you are two year old. When you are two year old, you don't drink coffee. Yeah. So what do you imprint? The aroma. Aroma is a trigger that opened the door to all the reference system that has been imprinted at that time. What we discover is when people, uh, when we trigger aroma, people say, oh, mother is in the kitchen. She's preparing breakfast. She's going to feed me. I'm home, I'm safe. I mean, all that is part of what is triggered by the code. The code is that, you know, you punch a number on the door to open the door. But what is key is what that, that leads to, that leads to all this reference system. And so everything, every word that we use, uh, you know, and, and my life is going to be too short to explore all these codes around the world, which I've done already in many countries. But this is fantastic because it's more than translation. You see, when you look at translation, it means different things. You know, I've, I've done a lot of work in South America and uh, the word family in Mexico, for example, is not the same word as family in the US. And it's not the same word as family in France or in Germany. So we say family, like we say, we, know, we think we know what we're speaking about. But if we don't know the code, the culture code, uh, we might make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. And... Uh... In your book, you share several experiences with uh, the most famous companies uh, in the world. Uh, I could mention NASA or uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chrysler or um, Wrangler or different other, also uh, different other companies. Do you have in, any one uh, experience that marked you more than the others? Would you uh, share any uh, experience that marked you more than others? Well. I'm not sure I understand the question, but, um, you know, uh, uh, the difference between different companies, what, what you mean? Oh, oh. No, I mean, I mean, you worked for, for the, the most famous companies in the world, right? Yeah. Is there anyone that uh, your memory is marked more? I mean, uh, you lived a, a different experience that uh, you remember most of all. Yeah, you see, well, there are so, so many memories, you see. Um, first of all, I think that these, these companies, usually they have very brilliant people, very intelligent people, yeah. uh, you know, coming from Harvard and uh, Oxford, whatever. But what my experience is, is uh, the answer is easy. The question is difficult. The question, they usually have the wrong question. And so when they ask me uh, to, to, to solve something, my task is to help them to become aware that they have a wrong question. They, they think already in terms of solution, 
when we, we, we need to discover what, what is the first imprint. And, you know, if they tell me, what are you going to discover? Well, I say, I'm sorry, I don't know. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a discovery. Obviously. <laughs> If I knew ahead of time, so my experience with most of these uh, big companies is that um, they have a hypothesis, which means they already have an idea of what is the solution, and they're not doing discovery. They just try to verify, to keep their job, and to be consistent to what they think is the right answer, you see. So that that's my first uh, concern, and sometimes it's difficult to uh, help them to understand that uh, they're going to spend a lot of money uh, but I don't know what I'm going to discover. Oh, so what do we? What are we paying for to discover what is the code? But I don't know what we're going to discover. My experience also is uh, this, this is like a, a, a blind, mind blowing, if you want. This is such a big discovery. When they discover something like that, they say, "Wow!" See, this is like, like for example, I remember uh, many companies like PNG, for example, that was Procter and Gamble, one of my big clients. We've done 25 yeah. codes for them. 25 codes. And after a while, they have their own language. They say, okay, let's discover the aroma of this one. You know, this is a new brand that's nothing to do with coffee. But for them, aroma was a reference system in their mind that they yeah. want to go beyond, beyond at the deeper level of, of understanding. Uh, my, my best reward with all this company is that they reorder. You know, at the beginning, it's very difficult to convince them. You see, uh, I want one of my big clients, and I, and I love them dearly, is Boeing. Boeing. The first time I presented my work at Boeing uh, in Seattle, um, I was a bunch of engineers, and they asked me, I say, where are your numbers? Where are your numbers? And uh, I said, well, I don't know what you mean by number, but I don't believe in statistics. Huh? Um, you know, if you look at Brexit, 52% uh, of the people say that they wanted to stay and, and 48 want to say wanted to leave and the results were the opposite. So I don't believe what people say. Oh, so that was already triggered their interest. Then I say, look, I'm, I designed the PT Cruiser for Chrysler and, um, you know, uh, uh, Bob, Bob Lutz and, and, and Bob Eaton asked me to uh, create a car that would sell at least 500,000 units. And if you want numbers, we, we sold more than 1.5 million. So that's my number. <laughs> you know, it's not statistics, it's result. you see. And that's what I like about my work is that, for example, with Boeing, we, they're still my clients today. They've been my clients for 15 years. You know, we have done work with them in India, in China, in Brazil, all over Europe, in the US. Uh, they reorder. So it's difficult to convince them at the beginning, but when they see results, wow, then they become my friends and we work together, you know, almost forever. Is ever the beginning the hardest part, uh, based on what you say, because they measure you in the beginning, right? They ask you for statistics, for numbers, yeah. but first of all, I have to taste, you say, you know? I have to, yeah. to, to try and the, the, to ask to the people before yeah. to find the, the the answer. The first, the, 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 the main part is the, the question, right? Yeah. yeah, but you see, one of, one of my ways to show uh, the power of the code is once we discover a code, uh, we look at all the competitors and we look at who are the ones that are on code, the ones that are not on code. And then we have numbers here because we can say the ones that are off code, they should not be successful. Obviously. The ones that are on code should be successful. So that's a way to to verify, to you know, one thing that they used to say uh, at PNG, they say Dr. Rapai can predict the past. Okay, so of course this is kind of looks like a joke, right? But no, because at a certain time they did show me something that nobody knew about it. They had a project, and right. they try something, and they say, okay, you don't know what happened, but we know what happened. That was five years ago. Tell us what happened according to the code, and I was able to tell them. This will be a mistake and that will be a failure for this and this and this reason. And they knew. I didn't know, but they knew the data. And they said, well, you're right. <laughs> that was a failure. So, you see, th there is many ways. Once, once we get the code, this is amazing. One thing that is so powerful, too, is when you get the code, you know, my clients send me mails all the time that reinforce the code. They say, oh, my God, this is happening again. You know, see, this is a, they call it the code in action. 
oh, this is again happening, this is happening, wow. And so, they, we, because the code doesn't change, you see the, the difference between people that study trends um, is that the trends keep changing. But the code is imprinted at an early age and it, it lasts for you know gen several generations. You see, I've done this kind of work for Alpha Century and the code that I discovered 50 years ago, I'm still working today. So yeah. I can tell you it will last more than half a century, but at least you know that if I discover a new code today, there's a good chance that for the next 50 years, it will be working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, according with what is what we saw before about the people that you, um, you, you face in the beginning, right? Uh, did you find a better way during these years when since the beginning of your job uh, on the code and to show them before the trends, before the statistics, um, uh, your work? Uh, did you find a better way to let them understand you uh, and your job? Um, or because you now you are famous, because you're famous is not necessary anymore. Because you're famous now, they believe you. Or do you do you find did you find a way that to uh, show them uh, your value uh, today that is easiest. Yeah, 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 certainly, certainly. You know, I'm, um, because they know me, they know my work, they saw many case studies that uh, and, yeah. and successes, so uh, they, they listen to me, right? But they still need to be convinced. You see, I, I think that even if I have the, the a certain prestige, you know, I wrote 17 books, uh, uh, I taught in several universities, so uh, sure, the, the, the culture code has been translated in uh, 14 languages and it's just been translated recently in Polish, in Poland. And I'm going to give a speech there in, in next, next month. So uh, th th that creates a certain expectation, of course, but is they still need to be convinced. And my experience is that the best people to explain what I do are my clients. Okay. They are the best, you see. Uh, I remember I was I was in Argentina, I mean, I saw, sorry, I was in Brazil working with Americans and Argentinians uh, for Fox, Fox News and so on. And um, the Argentinian came to the meeting uh, late and Boeing was part of the meeting uh, with Fox. And so, uh, they arrived late and I was supposed to go to an interview and uh, so they say, well, can you explain what we're going to do? And I said, well, you know, you are arriving late, I have a meeting, I'm sorry, I don't going to have the time. And uh, the people from Boeing that were there say, oh, Dr. Fai, we can do it, we can explain. Wow. And my client, Boeing, explained to the Argentinian everything that we were going to do. I think even better that I will do myself. Because they are in the business, they are in the and so and so. That's what I like the most is when when my clients uh, um, start speaking my language. Yeah, which is very interesting because they start using you know the reptilian brain, reptilian marketing, the logic of emotion, the first imprint, uh, you know the all, all, all this language, um, and and then they explain that to others. And and for me, this is fantastic. This is my best, uh, uh, you know. But now. Because of my uh, experience, uh, you know, I, I, I have my own language, of course, uh, and, and this is part of the methodology. But sometimes, uh, you know, for example, a company called Allianz, which is the big, big uh, insurance company in Germany. Um, and I, I work for them several times. They're still my client today. But at the beginning, they say, OK, uh, Dr. Rapai, we don't really understand everything that you say. And so they, they ask a, a gentleman, multicultural gentleman, uh, fantastic, very brilliant, that understood better than anybody else what I was doing, to translate. <laughs> what it means to translate is not from one language to another, it's for, for my mind to their mind, if you want, how to help them. And uh, um, he did a fantastic job, absolutely fantastic job. and and. Uh, um, you know, so, so at a certain time, some people need to uh, go into the detail of explanation uh, and understanding the, uh, the who are the people you're speaking to. You see, the, this gentleman is uh, English, uh, uh, Dutch, and German, so he understands uh, the three, the different languages, speaks the three languages, and um, he can he can go deeper than just a pure translation from one language to another. He, he does cultural translation. 
And so this is what is very interesting. You know, I'm, I'm doing a lot of work in, in China. Uh, uh, and last time again, a few months ago, I was uh, in Shanghai. And uh, to speak to the Chinese, you need to understand the Chinese code. Otherwise, they don't get it. They just, you know, they think that you, you're following a structure that doesn't resonate with them. You see, they, let me just give you a very simple example, and I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. not giving give you any secret, but food in China is not just food. Food in China is medicine. Ah, oh, right, yeah. So yeah. when you have a problem, headache, or stomach, whatever, you're going to eat certain food to take care of that. You see, so you, you, if you don't understand, if you treat food like just food and you put numbers and vitamins and protein and things like that, you made the point. You made the point. So that, that's what I mean by uh, cultural translation. We just need, uh, and, and this is one of my mission in life. I think that uh, uh, cultures don't understand each other. That's why we have so many wars around, you see. Uh, yeah. uh, for example, the Americans believe that uh, all South Americans are the same. Well, I mean, come on, you know, and most of them not even know that Brazil doesn't speak Spanish. You see, so they have a vision that they have one guy in charge of all South America. Uh, and they, sometimes they call that Latin America because they don't want yeah. to be Spanish, you know. But, yeah, come on, there is, you know, uh, I, I, I spend many years in South America and all these cultures are fascinating, very interesting, brilliant, but very different. Just to be curious, have you ever worked with any Italian company? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I've done work with Barilla. Barilla, you said the past. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and, and uh, we worked with them. We were very happy and we went to Russia with them. They oh. wanted to, yeah. And, and what we did, one thing we discovered in Russia for them, they, could, they, they wanted to sell dessert, dessert. Uh, not pasta, desserts. Desserts, dessert. But for them, a dessert in, in, uh, in Italy is something sweet, you know, yeah. uh, gelato or whatever. Yeah. And uh, what we discover is that dessert in Russia uh, is salty. Really? Salty. So, oh, what is that? So for them, we say, this is not dessert. I say, well, it's not Italian dessert, but this is Russian dessert. Obviously. <laughs> and you want to sell it to the Russians, so you better understand that. The imprinting of the Russians, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Curious, extremely curious. Yeah, yeah. You see, you see, it's, uh, um, th there is uh, one uh, culture and country that I like very much, and I was there last week, is Switzerland. Why do I like Switzerland? Because they have four official languages. Four. Not for not for the chocolate, for the languages, right? Well, they have four four official languages, but they have subcultures. You know, like they, they have an Italian right. subculture, a French True. subculture, a German subculture, a Romance subculture. That's and they, they have four official languages. Everything is in four languages. So how come you create a unity like Switzerland with all the different subcultures and all the different languages, right? Uh, because there is a common reptilian dimension. You see, the reptilian always win. That's my theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Switzerland was created 800 years ago and they had a big host and they swear that they will never be divided and never be invited by the Austrian again. And so they decide together to become strong soldiers. You know, the, the, the mercenaries, uh, Swiss mercenaries are very well known to be the best in the world. Uh, the Pope still have a guard uh, that is a Swiss guard, you know, so... Uh, Napoleon used, used to hire all the Swiss missionaries in, in his different uh, battles. So the army in Switzerland today is incredible. You know, you, you have 500,000 soldiers ready in five minutes in Switzerland. Right? They have guns, machine guns, ammunition, uniform at home. They're ready in five minutes. And then Two weeks every year, they have to go to a camp to practice shooting, to practice, you know, to rehearse what will happen. I mean, the, the Swiss are, are ready. Now, who is going to invent Switzerland? Tell me. I mean, you know, nobody's going to invent Switzerland, but just in case, they're ready. But at the same time, because of this reptilian survival dimension, yeah. uh, they are together. And the, the, the Swiss culture 
is very, very, very strong. I can tell you, uh, the German uh, are afraid of the Swiss German. The okay, German it's... Swiss are more German than the German. <laughs> it, it's incredible. So that, that's what I think is interesting. You know, what, how a culture is, is built around uh, uh, the survival dimension and, and, and the, the, the um, reptilian dimension. You know, it, 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 I've been interviewed many times uh, about Brexit. Brexit. I predicted Brexit. Really? I predicted Brexit very easily. Why did I do that? First, because I don't believe what people say. Second, when you see that the bureaucrats in mm. Brussels that are not accountable and not elected decide uh, what you're going to put in plate and eat every day. I mean, that goes against uh, the, the, the basic uh, island mentality of the Brits, you know. And, and the British always saw themselves as unique and different. You know, they, they look down to Europe. They look down to Europe, but they're not European. They, they, they're English and British first. Yeah? And so it, it's a, 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 one of my prediction, if you want, is that London is going to be very successful and it's going to be the next Singapore. The European Singapore is going to be in London, which means very, very low taxes, going to attract yeah. a lot of business, sure. a lot of business worldwide to have all the yeah. headquarters, uh, but a lot better than Brussels or, or Paris or, or Frankfurt. It's a strategic so that, place, yeah. The, the, the survival dimension of, of, of Brits is very strong and they will survive. I noticed what you told about the Switzerland people, uh, considering French people and Italian people, because uh, what I ever saw is that uh, while um, French people during difficult times uh, are united and they did the revolution, for instance, or last year, the Gilets Jaunes, the Gilets yeah, Jaunes. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. here in Italy, instead, we are not united. We are all divided because we are not yeah, a nation. Yeah. We have yeah. 200 of, uh, yeah. less than 200 yeah. years of nation. Uh, Veneto is uh, not according with uh, Lombardia or uh, uh, Campania. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. yeah. We are... No, no, I, and, 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 uh, I, I love Italy. I love it because it's beautiful. There is so much art. The food Obviously. is fantastic and the people are so friendly. I, I love to go to party in Italy. But when I say Italy, uh, I mean several things. Because yeah. when you go to the south, it's not the north. When you go yeah. to, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's it's a different subculture there. But more than culture, because they, they knew, you know, uh, uh, Napoli was occupied by the French. You had the French king and then the Spanish king. I mean, this is so many influence. I remember I was Venice and some people spoke a, a kind of a mix of Spanish and, and, and uh, Portuguese. So uh, Italy is new. But right. we have to remember yeah. that Germany is new also. 1870, that when Bismarck decided yeah. to invade France to create Germany. Germany, the, the kingdom, you know, Bavaria, was not German, really. It was Bavaria. Yeah. And they didn't have any choice because they say, if you don't come with us to attack the French, we attack you and we will destroy you. So no choice. Huh? So the, 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 this is still a work in progress, you see. On the other hand, uh, the Italian culture is very obvious. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, it's just incredible. You see, so uh, the, 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 what what I would like to see uh, is a unity created around some of the basic uh, values and, and principles uh, that are the Italian uh, values and principles. But politics is the, is difficult. Let's do, <laughs> let them talk about the volley politics. <laughs> very difficult. Yeah. We lost the government yet yesterday. Yeah, no, uh, I know. <laughs> um, we got the last two questions, Mr. Um, Dr. Rapai. According with your opinion, considering from one side that what you have discovered during these decades uh, lived and proved what is the main mistake that the marketing consultings uh, and agencies do when they deliver their strategies. Well, during these years, you uh, use the code and you showed how the code is important, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. So what about the marketing consultant that you meet uh, that don't use the code? Um, where are the big mistakes that they uh, still are doing? 
you know, the, it, it, my answer is very simple, very simple. The big mistake is to believe what people say. Yeah, that's it. That's it. You know, if you believe Easy. what people say, you're going to make big mistakes, big mistakes. You see, so um, the, 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 they, they go they go to questionnaire and survey and polls and they ask people what they're going to do. And I, but, you know, when you are on the phone trying to answer a question, it's not the same that when you have to make the right decision at the very moment. You see, this is different. You know, I, 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 I can tell you without going in politics that um, uh, before Trump was elected, uh, uh, all the survey, all the politicians, all the marketing people say, no question, Hillary has a 100% chance right, to be elected. Right, right. Everybody, everybody, not one person say. Now, why? Because when they question people and they say, oh, tell me, you're not going to vote for Trump. Why are you not going to vote for Trump? Yeah? So it's not a question, it's already an answer. And the person already say, of course not, of course not, I'm not going to vote for that. But when they are voting, they don't care. This is anonymous. And then the majority of the people that were relevant uh, uh, voted for, for Trump. So, which are the big surprise, big surprise. You know, I, I, I remember all, all these uh, big marketing people were crying, they were crying. <laughs> How come we seem to be so wrong? You know, there, there is a, a journalist, Krugman, in, in the New York Times, that wrote a whole page explaining why he was so sorry that he didn't understand. He said, I don't understand America. Well, no, you don't. <laughs> That's clear. <laughs> so so th this is what is interesting here. You, 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 the reptilian always win, not the cortex. What not makes sense? Mm -hmm. What is logical? That's what you're going to pretend you are intelligent when people interview you, ask you questions. But at the, at the deep, at, at the gut level, uh, you, you know, you know what is better and, and you, uh, or you feel the way it is better. And this yeah. is what you're going to do. And the same with Brexit, the same with Brexit. You know, this is uh, all, all the intellectual in London uh, were against Brexit. But the large majority of the people in, in, uh, in uh, Great Britain uh, were to leave. They wanted to leave. Yeah. The last uh, question. Um, do you think that uh, the trium brain theory would have uh, the, any, uh, any additional discovery in the future? Yes. Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, and this is part of my uh, field and, and my fight, if you want. I believe that um, every culture has three brains. Yeah. So every culture. So the next move for the three brain theory is to say, OK, uh, uh, what is the cortex of the Italian cult culture? Uh, right. What is the lambic of the Italian culture? But what is Good. the reptilian? You know, uh, for example, one thing that is very reptilian at it, it's, and it's a core center for almost every culture is food. Yeah. Food. You see, why is so, it's so important? Because you have to eat every day uh, and that comes from your mother. Your mother was maybe breastfeeding you. So the food is a key element. So uh, it, it might sound strange, but if you want to understand how people are going to buy or vote tomorrow, you might understand how they relate to food, even if you're not selling food. You see, that's what is the key. And then there is sex and then there is violence. Uh, yeah. Sex is creating life. And violence yeah. is killing people. So, you know, it, it's, it's quite interesting to see again that we can understand these aspects in every culture. They're very different. You know, I, I, I discovered a code recently about sex in China. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. Then I compare China with Japan because I've done the code for sex in Japan also. And um, in Japan, they say sex has nothing to do with love. Mm -hmm. Okay, why? Because love is a temporary disease. So you don't create a family based on sex and creating children on a temporary disease. So you are in love. By the way, the, 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 every, every Friday night in Tokyo, on the uh, uh, beaches of Tokyo, uh, young, young teenagers uh, send uh, you know, text messages to everybody and they get together and they are in love and they're going to kill themselves. They go to kill themselves to commit suicide together. You know, why? Because they are in love. Oh, okay, so this is, you know. The, so if you don't understand the code here, you, because I, I work for Match.com in, in Japan. Yeah. 
much that come is try to make people getting together uh, to uh, to get married. Yeah. Uh, but they don't understand the, the recipe, the formula, the code that is very different in Japan, in China, as it is in America. And so th- that's why I think the three brains are so useful if we apply that to cultures. You see, wh- wh- when you see uh, American uh, gun violence, uh, which is always on the news all the time, you see, um, it's, it's, it's just uh, so powerful. But if you look at the German, uh, when the German Panzer division attacks you, they killed millions of people. <laughs> you know? So they might not shoot people, in, uh, kids in, in school today. But there is a dimension. The French are not better, by the way, because look at Napoleon. He invaded all Europe, <laughs> killing mm-hmm. everybody. So, but but there, there is a different structure in this violence, you see, violence. So that, that I think is fascinating. I think it's fascinating to look at cultures uh, because my mission is to try to, to help cultures to respect and understand each other. Good purpose. Good purpose. So... Uh, we are at the end, Dr. Rapai. Um, there's anything that you want to add to this interview? Yes, yes. You see, I, I, um, I, I believe that uh, the notion of nation is obsolete. You see, and, and one of the reasons why there are so many wars still around the world today yeah. Yeah. is this nationalist dimension there. I, I'm not against protecting your nation, protecting your culture. I understand that. Uh, but if you look at the Kurds, uh, the Kurds, uh, they, 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 have, they have a culture. Yeah. But they are in, in three or four different countries, different nations. So uh, why are they fighting? Because they want to preserve their culture. And I, you know, I, I wrote uh, many yeah. years ago uh, what I call the rights of cultures. I think cultures should be protected, should have the right to exist, should be the right to uh, uh, promote their values and things. But on the same time, they should respect other cultures. You see, and, and I think the big issue here about immigration um, is that, you know, people are afraid to lose their culture. You see? Yeah. So if we have this notion of, develop the notion of respect, respect the culture, uh, respect this culture, uh, and, you know, be proud of your own culture, but in the same time, respect the culture that you're meeting. Or, no. And so I, I believe that there is a, a way to create what I call the peace of culture, la paix de culture. I think that's, you know, and, and my crazy goal, but I like to be crazy, of course, more than often, uh, as often as possible, <laughs> is and to create a, a, a substitute to the United Nation, uh, which is completely obsolete and completely uh, irrelevant today, but to have the united cultures of the world. And so then, then you know, united cultures, we're all together and we respect each other and we want to promote uh, each other culture, but uh, th- this is not a power game anymore. Yeah. It's, it's seeing the value of the cultures. Just to be in peace, everybody. Yeah. And to be the good. Yeah. I am according with you. So I want to thank you for your time and for this My opportunity. Pleasure. My pleasure. The pleasure is for, for me extremely high because uh, uh, I repeat, uh, I found your book uh, awesome. Your book, uh, I want to repeat to people, please buy it and read it because it's uh, awesome. And uh, uh, I hope to see you soon, maybe in another interview, I, I don't know, maybe in live. Thank you for uh, to be, uh, for be here and uh, See you next time or have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. My Bye. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.